Um, all right. This is the last meeting for four weeks after tonight. So let's make the most of it. We're starting on page 38. For those of you that can get to the text. And I'll read. You take your time. Enjoy your food. But it's the, the title that we, the, the, the subset that we left off at was Beginningless, The Beginningless World of Buddhahood and the Beginningless Nine Worlds. And I just wanted to ask again, to see if we can carry on from the thought process from last time. What is, what, when we talk about the beginningless world of Buddhahood, what is that? There's no beginning of the Buddha. <laughs> Huh? That's not beginning of the... No, there is beginningless Buddha. Yeah, beginning oh, beginning Just like there's beginningless oh. nine worlds. This is Kuang Ganjo. This yeah, is yeah, Kuang Ganjo. Yeah. Okay, so, so what's, be what's beginningless... What's the beginningless world of Buddhahood? And the beginningless nine worlds. I said that it just exists. Uh, is it a moment that you realize? Yeah. No. Um, again, this is a moment that has always existed whether you realize it or not. The bottom line is that beginningless, the beginningless world of Buddhahood is the ninth consciousness. It is Namyoho Rengekyo. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. understand it. Namyoho Rengekyo didn't pop up later at some point downstream. Namyoho Rengekyo is the original state. When I keep talking about constantly the original state, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. I am talking about the beginningless the world of Buddhahood. Yeah. Yes. And okay. then, now, that's the tenth world, right? That's Buddhahood. Does, does that ever exist by itself? No, so beginningless nine worlds is always a part of that original state. Do you understand? Yes. But the original state itself is nam yoho rengekyo. There's no separation. Mm -hmm. Everybody's with me? Mm -hmm. You're yeah. shaking your heads. Yeah. Do you really understand the concept? Okay, this is Kuang Ganjo. This is, yeah. again, oh, yeah. that's, that's what we're talking about here is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, something that precedes numberless major world system dust particle kalpas ago. It's the predication of the Buddhism of the sowing being different from the Buddhism mm -hmm. of the harvest. It's the basis of the Buddhism of, of true cause versus the Buddhism of true effect. Do you understand? Okay. So, and what's the, what's, what's the true cause? Beginningless nine worlds. True effect is beginningless Buddha. True cause is... Birth... The nine yeah. worlds are the mother and the father. Yes. They yeah. always precede. Nobody pops out in ten. Mm -hmm. No yeah. one has ever popped out in ten. Mm -hmm. This is the point. Mm -hmm. That's why the nine worlds can never be diminished because they are the mm -hmm. only vehicle that gets you to a place where you can participate in ten, even perceive it. Do you understand? Do you follow? Mm -hmm. yes. All right, so... Here, let's, let's go on now, on, on page 38. The beginningless world of Buddhahood and the beginningless nine worlds. It was Nichiren who discerned that the essential law for the attainment of Buddhahood by ordinary people was hidden in the depths of lifespan. Do you all understand that? Mm -hmm. Did Tentai perceive that? Did Tentai d divine the original state? What did I just ask you and you answered? What is the original state? Right, right. It's Nam Yoho Rengekyo. It's the ninth consciousness. It's the beginningless world of Buddhahood and the beginningless nine worlds because the two, those two things can never be separated. Do you understand? Yes. All right, so it reveals that the nine worlds are all present in beginningless Buddhahood and that Buddhahood is inherent in the beginningless nine worlds. Inherent. Do you understand? Okay, so it was there even though you weren't born into the tenth world. The tenth world was inherent in your beginningless nine worlds. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is the true mutual possession of the ten worlds, the true hundred worlds and thousand factors, and the true thousand, uh, three thousand realms in a single moment of life. That's a quote from the Gosho itself, from the opening of the eyes. Why? 
it's only in this predication of each and Sanzen mm. that true mutual possession of the ten worlds occurs and actual each and Sanzen is possible. And in the absence of actual each and Sanzen, Buddhahood is a concept. It's a theory. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Only in actual each and Sanzen does Buddhahood manifest as Buddhahood. Mm. It's an idea. It's a concept outside of that. Okay, that's why he qualifies now the Buddhists and the selling involving the true Ichin and Sanzen. Do you understand? The Ichin and Sanzen that preceded Nam Yoho Rengeto is an Ichin and Sanzen that is theoretical in its entirety. It cannot, uh, 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 it cannot lead to actual Ichin and Sanzen. Actual Ichin and Sanzen occurs with the uh, meeting of a relationship between the original teacher and the original disciple. Do you understand what I just said? Actual Ichinen Sanzen only comes from the Gohonzon and Daimoku to the Gohonzon from the Bodhisattva of the earth, striving to attain Buddhahood in the nine worlds. Do you understand? That's the only time it occurs. That's what makes what we're talking about so significant and special. Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of people that say a lot of stuff. This is the only one that comes across. That's why we're going to go into chapter four in the fivefold comparison. And I want to get that done before we get out of here tonight. So this is back to the lecture. In terms of the literal meaning of the text, and when we talk about the literal meaning of the text, what are we talking about? Whenever he talks about the literal meaning of the text, what is he referring to? He's referring to the Buddhism of the harvest. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. He's referring to theoretical Buddhism. All right? In terms of the literal meaning of the, of the text, beginningless Buddhahood is the eternal and ever, ever abiding life state of Buddhahood gained by the Buddha of original attainment in the remote past. As indicated earlier, this Buddha is also endowed with the life states of the nine worlds. Therefore, Nichiren says the nine worlds are all present in beginningless Buddhahood. This Buddha, though having secured the life state of Buddhahood, continues to struggle steadfastly in the reality of the nine worlds to lead living beings to enlightenment. For this Buddha, life states of the nine worlds that are seeped in suffering and sorrow function to help others attain Buddhahood. Ordinarily, suffering and sorrow tend to lead people to withdraw to sap their vitality and strength. But when these are experienced in a life state of the nine worlds endowed with beginningless Buddhahood, they can function as empathy and great compassion to lead others to enlightenment. They can become powerful motivating emotions that arise because of the power of Buddhahood is continuously active in our lives and because our lives are open to the world and those around us. Everybody's with me? Yes. That's the Buddhahood we attain, right? Yes. We're not the original Buddha. We're the original disciples of the original mm -hmm. Buddha. You mm -hmm. understand? Okay. Yeah. So, next Nietzsche says, Buddhahood is inherent in the beginningless nine worlds, in the, in the lives of common mortals. All right? Yes. Let us first look at this p passage based on the literal meaning of the text. What are we talking about again? Literal meaning means... Shakyamuni, yes. means Buddhism of the, har of the harvest. Yes. In, the, in his treatise, The Words and Phrases of the Lotus Sutra, the great teacher Tintai of China writes, when the Buddha reached the first stage of security, he had already acquired eternal life. All right, are you, are you aware? Are you, what's the first stage of security? That's number 11 out of the 52. That's the state of non-regression, right? Mm. That's where you can't go backwards. Mm -hmm. All right, you will eventually go forward through countless kalpas until you finally attain Buddhahood. All right, that's the literal meaning because that's the Buddhism of the harvest, yeah. right? On the surface, when the Buddha reached the first stage of security, he had already acquired eternal life. In other words, by pursuing the Bodhisattva way in the remote past, Shakyamuni had already acquired the ever-abiding life state of the world of Bodhisattva when he ascended to the first stage of security, the stage of non-regression, which is stage number 11 out of the 52, right? All Bodhisattvas initially make four universal vows, including the vow to save innumerable living beings. 
We could say that everybody remembers what they, those four universal vowels are. Do you want me to go look them up? Four universal vowels. <coughs> Point five here, hang on. Chapter three, point five, four universal vowels. The four, also four great vowels are simply four vowels, vowels that every bodhisattva makes upon initially resolving to embark, embark on Buddhist practice. That would say you've already all made the, these vowels, okay? Mm -hmm. You are living right now in this life state, pursuing what you're pursuing, doing what we're doing around this table because you took these vows, okay? And the vows are, um, uh, to save innumerable living beings, to eradicate countless earthly desires, to master immeasurable Buddhist teachings, and to attain supreme enlightenment. Those four vows are all contained in what? They're already all contained within the practice of the Buddhism of the Soe. Okay? You don't have to go out of your way to master innumerable teachings. If you master the teaching of the Buddhism of the Harvest, that's the only teaching you needed to master. Do you understand? Okay? So... Um, where am I? Give me a page number in a column. Okay. All bodhisattvas initially make four universal vows, including the vow to save innumerable living beings. We could say that people gain the ever abiding, ever abiding, that means continuously existing, right? Yeah. Life state of the world of bodhisattva when they have confidence that the Bodhisattva way of life is correct and reaffirm their vow never to regress in Bodhisattva practice. Because Shakyamuni possessed this unshakable vow, he pursued the path of Bodhisattva practice without uh, uh, end, even after he attained Buddhahood. Do you understand that? What he's, that's what he's saying? The reason he existed continuously in the Sahe world is because he continuously lived as a bodhisattva, even though the, he had attained Buddhahood, majorless number world system, dust particle kalpas ago. You understand? Mm -hmm. All right, so then what did he just describe too? He says, all bodhisattvas initially make four universal vows, including the vow to save innumerable living, living beings. We could say that people gain the ever abiding life state of the world of bodhisattva, okay? The ever abiding life state, Okay, a bodhisattva, when they have confidence that the bodhisattva way of life is correct and reaffirm their vow never to regress in bodhisattva practice. What's that called? What is that? What is that? Come on. That's moogie washing. Mm -hmm. You know, doubt-free faith leads you to be able to perceive what was just described there and allows you to have the capacity and fortitude mm -hmm to continue throughout the course of your life to achieve it, right? You don't, if, you don't, if you don't perceive yourself as a bodhisattva of the earth, you will never perceive yourself as a Buddha. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is the point. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. All right, so then Nichikan very importantly clarified this. The 26th high priest of, Nich of the Nikko lineage, which is what we're, our, the whole basis of everything we're discussing is predicated on, known as a leading restorer of Nichiren Buddhism, commented on this passage from Tentai just cited in the six-volume writings. He writes, From this principle, it is very clear that original cause is ever-present. Okay, it's not like original cause happened and then original effect and original cause stayed back there. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. So that's what he's saying. Original cause, so the basis of the simultaneity of cause and effect is the basis of Buddhism. All right, is the basis of nam myoho ren gekyo. This concept that original cause is ever present is part of the concept of the simultaneity of cause and effect. Yes. Do you understand? It's why we can do all this miracle stuff without having to do lifetimes preceding it of cause that would lead to that and then seeing it expressed in lifetimes after that point. Do you understand? It's why we can be the Buddha exactly as we are right now without changing ourselves in any way, all right? From this principle, it's very clear that the original cause is ever present. That is why it is called the beginningless nine worlds. The original cause is ever present in the beginningless nine worlds. The beginningless nine worlds are original cause, not original effect. Do you understand? 
Everybody's with me, right? Yes. This has been a progression of the things that he's saying, mm -hmm. right? Nichiren calls the ceaseless dedication to ending, unending bodhisattva practice the beginningless nine worlds. What's he talking about? Because he's qualifying this. Beginningless nine worlds isn't like beginningless nine worlds of one through nine. Beginningless nine worlds are actually the beginningless nine, nine worlds that are contained with beginningless ten worlds. Yeah. Yeah. But the beginningless tenth world is something that only occurs if the beginningless nine worlds have activated to bring it forward. Do you understand? That's why we don't call it beginningless not ten worlds. Because it's theoretical until it's attained. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. That's why we have that differentiation of beginningless nine worlds and beginningless ten as though they're two different things. They're not two different things, but beginningless ten is a concept. It is theoretical until beginningless nine worlds open it up mm -hmm. and provide access to it. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the original cause. That's life. That's existence. That's what allows you to be the Buddha. You can't be the Buddha if you don't exist. Mm. Yes. Right? Yeah. right? Makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the pre Lotus Sutra teachings view the nine worlds as being impermanent and the world of Buddhahood as eternal, like God and earth. Okay? That's not the deal. Not the Buddhism of the sowing. Mm -hmm. All right? And, ever, and, and Buddhahood as eternal and ever abiding. Consequently, to bridge the seemingly insurmountable gulf between them, they set forth the concept of working gradually toward enlightenment by carrying out bodhisattva practice over countless lifetimes across an incalculable long period of time, an incalculably long period of time. But because these teachings are based on having to discard the nine worlds, quit being a human being, go to heaven, as Jesus, basically what they're saying, what you had to do, right? You had to perfect your life. Yes. You had to become flawless. You had to become the Buddha. All right? All right, so, but because these teachings are based on having to discard the nine worlds before one can reach the world of Buddhahood, they ultimately put forth a view that abhors and seeks to eliminate the earthly desires innate in the nine worlds. You shouldn't want to have sex. You shouldn't want to eat steaks. You shouldn't want to make more money. You shouldn't want to marry the beautiful person that you've, you're attracted to. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. we, yeah. it, it's all a process of minimizing and minimizing. Right. Okay? It is... It, uh, they, they ultimately put forth a view that abhors and it seeks to eliminate earthly desires innate in the nine worlds. What yeah. do we do as, Buddhists, as, as true Buddhas, though? Mm -hmm. We can form the environment to show actual proof. Mm -hmm. we, we, we're not, we don't abhor any of that. Mm -hmm. Well, we're not supposed to. Now, there are people that confuse the beliefs of other religions and incorporate them into Buddhism and suddenly start having value and non-value in a secular way where they judge others, that is not included in this. Do you understand? That is an incorrect understanding. Do you understand? So when you see Soka Gakkai members that start to moralize, create a moral basis of judgment or on, at any level, it's absolutely incorrect. Because beginningless nine worlds includes everything. Mm. All ten worlds are all clean and pure. Didn't we read that in the OTT? Yeah. All ten worlds are clean and pure. This is saying all ten worlds are clean and pure. But the provisional, the provisional teachings, the ones we reject, mm. say all ten worlds are not clean and pure. Mm. Some of them are stinky awful. We should try and get rid of them. We should try and live lives that eliminate them from our future existences. It's impossible. Right. You cannot manifest then, if that's the case. Mm. You don't have all ten worlds to manifest and utilize as an existence, right? Mm. Okay, so there's no beginninglessness to that. Mm. All right? So, but because these teachings are based on having to discard the nine worlds before one can reach the world of Buddhahood, they ultimately put forth a view that abhors and seeks to eliminate the earthly desires innate in the nine worlds. In contrast, 
The essential teaching of the Lotus Sutra expounds both the eternal life state of Buddhahood and the eternal Bodhisattva way that represents its actual practice. The Bodhisattvas of the earth, the practice of the Bodhisattvas of the earth, and reveals the principles of the inclusion of the nine worlds in Buddhahood and the inclusion of Buddhahood in the nine worlds. Further, by clarifying the original cause and original effect of Shakyamuni's enlightenment, it indicates that the ten worlds exist eternally in the life of each person and invalidates all previously described. Invalidates all previously described. Right? Remember what, I said, what he said here, back here, ways back? You knock down the causes of this when all the effects are wiped out. Once those effects are wiped out, all the other causes that preceded are wiped out. Once those causes are wiped out, those effects are wiped out. Once those effects are wiped out, the causes that preceded them are wiped out. That's what he's talking about. All right? Where am I? Top of page 39, right? Yeah. Yeah. By elucidating? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. By elucidating. The original cause and original effect and the principle that Buddhahood and the nine worlds are originally inherent and eternally present in life. The essential teaching of the Lotus Sutra firmly establishes that life is endowed with the ten worlds. That is why Nichiren says that the revelation of the doctrine of original cause and original effect and the essential teaching of the Lotus Sutra establishes the true mutual possession of the ten worlds, the true hundred worlds and thousand factors, the true 3,000 realms in a single moment of life. Everybody's with me? Yes. Okay, so what's that say though? Did the correct teaching exist prior to the essential teaching, the second 14 the, the last 14 chapters of the Lotus Sutra? In all of the Buddhism of the, of the harvest, of the 60, 50, 60 years, whatever it was, the Shakyamuni taught, preached. It's 60 years, yeah, because he started from 19 to 80. So 60. I don't want to keep screwing that up. So in that 60 years, how much of that 60 years of teaching was actually true? Until the last minute. Only the last half of the Lotus Sutra. Yeah. And then based on that last half of the Lotus Sutra, not an independent perception of the Nirvana Sutra, but perceiving the Nirvana Sutra based on what the Lotus Sutra already just clarified. Do you understand? <coughs> Everything else was in expedient means. Mm -hmm. yes. All right? This is why Nietzsche says, okay, uh, that the, the revelation of the doctrine of original cause and original effect in the essential teaching of the Lotus Sutra establishes the truth for the first time in all the teachings of, of, of Shakyamuni. It is to remem be remembered, however, that this explanation is based solely on the literal meaning of the sutra. That we're still now talking about the Buddhism of the harvest. We're still talking about it from the perspective of Shakyamuni's life. Yeah. Do you understand? Yeah. All right, so he says, now, on a deeper level, we can view these principles as not only applying to the one person Shakyamuni, but to all living beings. In other words, they demonstrate that all living beings are entities that originally seek to manifest their eternal Buddhahood and undertake unceasing Bodhisattva practice and that at their very core, all without exception yearn for the happiness of both themselves and others. Everybody's with me? Yes. In Nichiren's statement about the original cause and original effect in the above passage, we can discern the inherent hidden in the depths of the sutra. Pardon, we can, we, pardon me. We can discern the inherent, pardon me, I keep saying in here. <laughs> we can discern the intent hidden in the depths of the sutra to reveal the original cause and original effect of enlightenment for all people. Nichikan further comments on the teaching implicit in the lifespan chapter. The mystic law of hearing the name and the words of the truth in the remote past, the actual 3,000 realms in a single moment of life, is hidden in the depths of the passage relating to Shakyamuni's original cause for attaining the first stage of security. How did he attain the first stage of security? That's in the. Uh, that's when he makes the comment about. Um, uh, I originally, I originally practiced the Bodhisattva way. Okay, that's the clear. That's the statement of, of the attainment of the original state of security. All right, the first state. 
Everybody's with me? Yeah. All right, I'm going on to page 40 then, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. First stage of security, all right, means a state of mind in which the ultimate purpose of life is fixed on realizing enlightenment for oneself and actualizing the enlightenment of all people. It refers to a state of life in which one is firmly resolved to pursue the bodhisattva way eternally, no matter the difficulties, without ever regressing in practice. The moment in the distant past when Shakyamuni determined to forever practice the eternal bodhisattva way comprises the original cause of his enlightenment. Nietzsche Khan, however, goes a step further by saying that it is the mystic law of hearing the name and the words of the truth in the remote past, the actual 3,000 realms in a single moment of life, the fundamental law for, the attain for attaining Buddhahood, nam myoho renge -kyo, that was the driving force behind the practice that enabled him to achieve the first stage of security. Wow, that was a deep paragraph. Did you understand what he just said there? No. Okay, no. Let, me, let me go back and qualify this to you because he's talking about you. He's talking about you. He's saying first stage of security. If you're a bodhisattva of the earth, have you attained the first stage of security? Yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. Again, you're a greater Buddha than Shakyamuni. Yeah. In reality, you're a true Buddha. You're yeah. not using expedient means to propagate the teaching that allows for you to be a Buddha in this lifetime. Do you understand that? That's not to put down Shakyamuni. That's to qualify the greatness of the Buddhas, Buddhism of the sowing. That this all this expedient means kind of Buddhism really isn't what's going to accomplish widespread propagation, the elimination of suffering all people, Kopus, Kos, and Rufu. Do you understand? Only the Buddhism of the sowing, only the Buddhism of the original state, the Buddhism of, 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 of Nichiren, mm -hmm. Namya Horengekyo can accomplish that. So what is he saying? He's saying Shakyamuni. Uh, in, in making in reach the first stage of, uh, of security by uh, 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 pra uh, originally I practiced the Bodhisattva way, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Does that apply to us too or not? We are Bodhisattvas of the earth, yes or no? Yes, we yes. practice the Buddhism of the sowing, not yes. Buddhism of the harvest, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So our relationship was the, with, is with the original teacher, right? Yeah. Yeah. Not mm -hmm. Shakyamuni. Mm -hmm. Who was Shakyamuni's teacher? Mm -hmm. His dad. Mm -hmm. Okay? All right. But we, as Buddhas, all had to reach this first stage of security. Mm -hmm. What are we as bodhisattvas of the earth? Because of our relationship with the... Because we made a vow. Yes. Yeah. But, but, but yeah. when did we make that vow? Uh, we are the original disciples of the Buddha and his true identity. Mm -hmm. Okay? So... We actually attained this first stage, of, first stage of security prior to Shakyamuni. Okay, let me read this again. This is describing the bodhisattvas of the earth. This is describing true Buddhas. This is describing people that Nichiren is their mentor. Okay, not Shakyamuni. So I'm not talking about Shakyamuni. I'm talking about Shakyamuni got to our level. At a point, by doing all kinds of stuff that we don't have to do because we're the original disciples. Let me read this again. First stage of security means the point in time when you never regress. Okay? How is that possible? That's the time that you take the vow that you never go back on. That's why you never regress. Because of your reaching in. Because of your... Uh, 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 Doubt-free faith. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what propels you. It's you that propels you. It's not a godlike influence. It's not somebody doing you a favor. It's mm -hmm. not happening for any other reason other than you. Do you understand? Yes. And the fact that you are inseparable from all things, including Nam Yoho Rengekyo in the life of the original teacher. Right. All right? Mm -hmm. So, first stage of security means a state of mind in which the ultimate purpose of life is fixed on realizing enlightenment for oneself. What's that sound like? Bodhisattvas of the earth, right? Yes. 
yeah. taking the vow, right? Yeah. right? And actualizing the enlightenment of all people. Widespread propagation, coast and roof, actual each and the sons, and correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. It, it refers to a state of life in which one is firmly resolved to pursue the Bodhisattva away eternally. What's that? Bodhisattva of the earth, doubt free faith. I actually am the Buddha. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is actual each and the sons, and still functioning as a Bodhisattva in your nine world real life. Do you understand? This mm -hmm. is Buddha functioning as. Bodhisattva of the earth, which is Buddha. Yeah. So you're talking in your mind. You have made an eternal declaration, even though you know you're going to live and die in this Sahi world. You don't look at your life as that. There is no ebb. There is no flow. We believe in the Buddhism of the sowing. We believe in the OTT teaching, right? right. Yeah. Okay. So, and we're going to do this no matter how, di how, no matter the difficulties. That's also what we vowed to overcome, right? Mm -hmm. Without ever regressing in practice, that's also what we've all promised, correct? The moment in the distant past, so, so, so this is describing us, correct? The moment in the distant past when Shakyamuni determined to forever practice, but we're, our original state is to do that. Right. Yeah. Do you understand? We're not Goyaku Jintingo people. We're Kuanganjo people. Yeah. Do you understand the difference? Mm. Doesn't that make the hair on your arm stand up? Mm. Yeah. Okay. That's what he's talking about. That's what he's trying to make sure that you understand. But he's doing it in a way so that if it's way over your head, he doesn't hurt your feelings or confuse you. <laughs> the moment in the distant past when Shakyamuni determined to forever practice the eternal, eternal Bodhisattva way comprises the original cause of his enlightenment. Nichikan, however, goes a step further by saying that it is the mystic law of hearing the name of the words of the truth, nam yoho renge kyo in the remote past. The actual Ichin and Senzen, the catalyst to become a real Buddha, actually not theoretically, not in a game, real, okay? The actual Ichin, and that comes from hearing the name and the words of the truth of nam yoho renge kyo. Do you understand? That's what he's saying. In a single moment of life, the fundamental law for attaining Buddhahood, Nam Yoho Rengeko. That was the driving force behind the practice that enabled Shakyamuni to achieve the first stage of security. It's the driving force behind everybody that reaches the first stage of security. Do you understand? There is no reaching the first stage of security in the absence of Nam Yoho Rengeko. Understand that. Because what will the Buddhism of the harvest get you to if you practice it through its 52 stages? It'll finally get you to the starting point of the Buddhism of the summit. Okay? All right, so you understand what I'm saying. That's why they're the same. Because one actually is just leading you to the truth of the other. It's not in conflict with it. It's an expedient means toward it. Do you understand? Okay. So, uh, hearing the name, where am I? Yeah. yeah. Hearing the name. Okay, hearing the name and the words of the truth here mm -hmm. means the stage of hearing the name and words of the truth. This is the stage of practice of someone who hears about the mystic law for the first time and embraces faith in it. The mystic law of hearing the name and the words of the truth in the remote past is the fundamental law through which, by practicing, an ordinary person can realize Buddhahood. And Nietzsche and Daishonin directly reveal this law as Nam Yoho Renge Kyo. Basically, the stage, the state that was just described as I read all of that, is the state that was achieved by Nietzsche that allowed him to uh, uh, manifest the Gohonzon from the depth of his life into concrete form. Understand that, okay? That is, as an ordinary purpose, person, hearing the name and the words of the truth. In other words, he says, I am just like you. I am not different from you. I'm not some saint that came down in a godlike way that's above you. I have come to the realization and the revelation of this truth as an ordinary person, just like you, because it applies to you in exactly the same way it applies to me. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Okay. All right, so the literal teaching of the lifespan chapter 
emphasizes the original effect of the, the literal teaching. Again, that means on the surface is the words. The literal teaching of the lifespan chapter emphasizes the original effect of Buddhahood attained by Shakyamuni, while the teaching hidden in the depths of the chapter emphasizes the one who practices the bodhisattva way. Because what's hidden in the depths is for all people. It's not a biography on an individual. Okay, which is the story of Shakyamuni and the Lotus Sutra. That's a biography of an individual. The depth, the teaching hidden in the depths is the story of all people. Do you understand? Right. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so while the teaching hidden in the depths of the chapter emphasizes the one person who practices the Bodhisattva way, which is the original cause, the latter clarifies, clarifies the original cause and original effect that represent the true causality for ordinary people in the nine worlds to become Buddhas in their present forms. Mm -hmm. So it suddenly elucidates. Uh, it's nam yaho rengeko. It's not being born as a 16th son, uh, son as great universal wisdom, excellence, Buddha, and going through innumerable being a deer and, you know, all that shit that he did. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. It's Nietzsche's way of living in the nine worlds. Do you understand? It's not this... Abstract mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. All right, so everybody's with me. Yes. Mm -hmm. This is the original cause and the original effect hidden in the depths of the sutra as taught by Nietzsche in Buddhism. Okay, so we don't go after what's on the surface of the sutra, is the Buddhism the harvest not going to lead you to anywhere but back to the Buddhism of sowing? That's why we go right into the depths, Nam Yoho Rengeko, Bodhisattvas of the earth, ever present Buddhahood already are the Buddha, time to manifest it and, and use the teaching that allows that to occur, all right? In other words, original cause is when an ordinary person hears about the mystic law for the first time, embraces faith, and resolves to practice the unending bodhisattva way. And the original effect is when the eternal life state of Buddhahood appears in the life of that ordinary person. Do you understand when that is? Mm -hmm. when, they're when they're chanting in front of the Gohonzon, right? So what is meant by beginningless nine worlds in Nichiren Buddhism? We can interpret it to be the state of life at the moment when ordinary people in the nine worlds break through the ignorance and illusion that has previously controlled their lives. Okay, what would that mean then? What is the break point? When you Delusion you versus actual Ichin and Sanzen. Yeah. Okay, understanding theoretically and having bought into it completely to the point that it's who you are. Um, break through the ignorance and illusion that has previously controlled their lives. Because this state of life gives rise to the function of Buddhahood, Nietzsche says, Buddhahood is inherent in the beginningless nine worlds. That all makes sense, right? Everybody's with me? Nobody's lost. Everybody understands this train of direction as far as this lecture, okay? It is faith that elucidates, or pardon me, that eradicates fundamental ignorance and illusion. Faith in the eternal mystic law, Nietzsche and established Nam Yoho Rengeku and the Gohonzon to enable all people to base their lives on this faith. Everybody's with me? Mm -hmm. In his letter to uh, Gijobo, com uh, commenting on the lifespan chapter passage, single-mindedly desiring to see the Buddha, not hesitating even if it cost them their lives. Nietzsche writes, as a result of this passage, I have revealed the Buddhahood in my own life. After stating that faith in the mystic law, Myoho Rengeko, is characterized by the spirit of not begrudging one's life, he offers three interpretations of the line, single-mindedly desiring to see the Buddha, to explain his own attainment of Buddhahood. One, single-mindedly single -mindedly observing the Buddha. Two, concentrating one's mind on seeing the Buddha. And three, when looking at one's own mind, perceiving that it is the Buddha. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. Do you understand why he qualified it as that? Those are three different levels of depth of perception. Okay? Single-mindedly observing the Buddha is focusing and concentrating on the Gohonzon. Okay? Yeah. Concentrating one's mind on seeing the Buddha is trying to actualize in your life that, mm -hmm. that fusion with the Gohonzon. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, and three is that, aha, there is no separation between me and the Gohonzon. I am Buddhahood. I am the Buddha. You get it? All right, so we can regard the first two interpretations as signifying the cause, because it was that effort that got you to that point where you went, aha, now I get it. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Actual Ichin and Sanzen is always preceded by theoretical Ichin and Sanzen, because theoretical Ichin and Sanzen is the foundation that says you can achieve actual Ichin and Sanzen. The only difference between actual and theoretical Ichin and Sanzen is actual Ichin and Sanzen, you've become the Buddha, rather than understanding what the Buddha is. Okay? Uh, with regard to the first two interpretations as, as signifying the cause, indicating sing, single-minded faith, and the third, when looking at one's own mind, perceiving that it is the Buddha, is signifying the effect, indicating the single-minded attainment of Buddhahood. The original cause and the original effect are actualized through single-minded faith. There's no separation between them. They're the simultaneity of cause and effect. Do you understand? Revealing the beginningless world of Buddhahood and the beginningless nine worlds in this manner closes the seeming divide between the impermanent life states of the nine worlds and the eternal life state of the world of Buddhahood and brings the two to exist together simultaneously. Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. As a result, the mutual possession of the ten worlds is established in the true sense, the true Ichin and Sansa. You got it? Mm -hmm. When the mutual possession of the ten worlds is established, the doctrine of 3,000 realms in a single moment of life is also established, the true Ichin and Sansa. Mm -hmm. Therefore, Nietzsche says this is the true mutual possession of the ten worlds, the true hundred worlds and thousand factors, the true three thousand realms in a single moment of life, and the true three thousand uh, realms in a single moment of life. Okay? What time is it? Okay, I can do this. All right, we're going to go over a little bit, but we're going to be gone for four weeks, so I'm going to go ahead and go through the five pages that uh, comprise chapter four. This, and we've already read about this, so it should be pretty easy. The five-fold comparison, mm -hmm. right? Clarifying the causality of life and the fundamental direction for human existence. In the first half of the opening of the eyes, Nietzsche and Daishonin outlines the teaching that later, when it was systemized by the high priest, the 26th high priest Nietzsche Khan, came to be known as the five-fold comparison. So understand that even though he put forth the doctrine, it wasn't really recognized as the five-fold comparison in a form that elucidated this, these differentiations until Nietzsche Khan did it as the 26th high priest, unless they existed as oral teachings. Now let us examine the significance of this comparison while summarizing what we have covered so far. We have already looked at how the three virtues, sovereign, teacher, and parent, form the theme of the opening of the eyes. Everybody's with me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nietzsche looks at the various individuals and beings re widely respected as sovereign, teacher, or parent, in the main philosophies and religions of his time. He specifically investigates Confucianism and the other philosophies and religions, uh, religious traditions of China, which are grouped together on the head, under the heading of Confucianism, or non-Buddhist scriptures, and referred to as external scriptures. Two, the, the pre- and non-Buddhist teachings of India, including Brahmanism, which are together referred to as non-Buddhist teachings, or the external way. And three, the teachings of Buddhism, which are referred to as the internal way. Nietzsche also inquires into what people are actually taught and the attitude toward life they cultivate through revering one or another of these esteemed beings. He does so because the touchstone for a figure who embodies the truly outstanding qualities of sovereign teacher and parent is whether the particular teaching that figure represents enables people to lead secure lives. Thus, in the opening of the eyes, taking up the theme of sovereign, teacher, and parent, Nietzsche delves incisively into the teachings and approaches to life that these different philosophies and religions propound. And the fundamental focus of his inquiry is the causal law of life. Do you understand what he's saying? What did he just say? He says, all these things are great and powerful things that a lot of people have paid attention to and they were stated by some really wise people, 
but now I'm going to take, I'm going to view them strictly from the law of causality and their functionality based on the ability to actual create effect. Cause followed by effect. Actual proof. Mm. Yeah. It's what he's talking about. I'm looking for something where you pray and the prayer is answered. Mm. All right? So he's saying, uh, thus the opening of the eyes takes up the theme of sovereign teacher and parent. Nietzsche delves incisively into the teachings and approaches to life that these different philosophies and religions propound. And the fundamental focus of his inquiry is the causal law of life. How in tune are they with the law, the simultaneity of the law of cause and effect? The heart of philosophy or religion lies in clarifying cause and effect. So he's saying, ultimately, that's what the real function of, of all philosophy is, is to show you how to live life in a way that you can manifest uh, circumstances that are in keeping with your desires. Mm. That's what cause and effect is, right? Mm. right? Okay, so the heart of philosophy or religion lies in clarifying what makes shit happen. Okay? That's really what he's saying. All right? The purpose of the five-fold comparison is to clarify which religion or philosophy can actually enable people to overcome their sufferings, actually attain people to overcome their sufferings, and attain a state of, a state of unshakable happiness, which we refer to as Buddhahood. Mm -hmm. This comparison involves evaluating the different teachings in terms of how they explain the workings of cause and effect in life, in other words, the causality of life, which refers to the causality behind happiness or unhappiness. Everybody's with me? Mm -hmm. All right. Ultimately, it is the same as the causality of the ten worlds and therefore, importantly, of attaining Buddhahood, which we discussed last time. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Understanding all religions and the attainment of enlightenment are the same thing. You with me? Yeah. All right. Stated another way, the fivefold comparison examines the relative superiority and depth of each teaching, assessing how much each pursues and fundamentally recognizes the causality behind happiness or unhappiness, mm -hmm. the simultaneity of cause and effect. Yeah. For example, when a physician treats an illness, unless that treatment is based on a thorough understanding of the cause, it may only intensify the patient's condition. Similarly, unless the fundamental causes are thoroughly understood, efforts to solve human suffering and misery will end up only worsening the situation. You chant with the same wrong understanding over and over and over and nothing happens. And you wonder why. Mm -hmm. And you think there's something wrong with the Gohonza. So he's saying you must understand. That's why we study. You've got to understand what the hell the deal is. All right? That's why I paraphrased that. You know, the heart of the philosophy of it is clarifying why shit happens. You have to understand why shit happens in order to utilize the Buddhism of the sowing in the most effective manner, which you will need to do in order to attain Buddha, Buddhahood in your present form, to achieve each actual each and sanza. He's saying, ultimately, is the same as the causality of the ten worlds, and therefore, importantly, of attaining Buddhahood, which we discussed last time. Stated another way, the fivefold comparison examines the relative superiority and depth of each teaching, assessing how much each pursues and fundamentally recognizes the causality behind happiness or unhappiness, the actual reason why we experience those things. For example, um, 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 pardon me, I'm, I'm rereading here. The heart of a religion or philosophy lies in clarifying cause and effect. The great, uh, page 44, first column, the great teacher Tintai of China cites five outstanding characteristics of the Lotus Sutra, which he sums up as the five major principles, name, essence, quality, function, and teaching. Of these, quality means the central doctrine or teaching of, the, of a sutra, its heart or core. More specifically, Tintai states that it is none other than the principle of cause and effect. The principle of cause and effect, um, of, of which, pardon me, to which Tentai refers is in fact the cause, causality of life whereas, wherein individuals who are steeped in misery cause reveal their most sublime and inner potential overcoming their sufferings and establish a life state of indestructible happiness effect. So what's that referring to? 
that's manifesting the state of the tenth world in any of those lower five or four. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's not having to become a high life condition, happy person before you can start to attack the unhappiness that's at the core of your life. That's what he just qualified. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Yes. Tentai defined the ultimate law of enlightenment as the true aspect. This true aspect corresponding to essence in the five major principles, he says, can only be described as unfathomable, beyond the power of words to describe, beyond the mind's power to comprehend. He indicates, however, that the true aspect is inextricably related to the causality of attaining Buddhahood. To borrow an analogy from Tentai, the true aspect can be likened to a vast and unbounded space, while cause and effect can be likened to pillars and beams. With the pillars and beams, the space takes on the shape of a room. At the same time, the pillars and beams could not be called such if they did not shape the space into a room. That's abstract, but do you understand the point that he's making? Mm -hmm. You've got something that encompasses all things. If it encompasses all things, how can you define it? It lacks definition because it encompasses all things, right? Mm -hmm. We can only start to begin to perceive it as something by beginning to utilize framing mm -hmm. that allows us to perceive it. That's what he's talking about there. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. All right, so... To bar okay, in other words, I'm sorry every time I look up, I, I lose my spot. In other words, the depth of the doctrine of causality expounded by a particular teaching correlates to the depth of the law of enlightenment that forms the teaching's basic premise. As, you, as you're able to build the room, the room can only be built based on truth. The teachings of nam myoho Rengekyo propagated by Nichiren consists of the ultimate mystic law, Myoho, and the cause and effect that it is based on, Renge. We can regard the single phrase, Nam Myoho Renge, as expressing the ultimate cause, pardon me, the ultimate law of cause and effect for attaining Buddhahood. Therefore, by chanting Nam Myoho Renge Kyo even one time, we can realize the cause and effect of attaining enlightenment in our lives at the very at that very moment. Does everybody understand what that just said? Mm -hmm. What did that just say? Mm -hmm. What did that just say? Very important point. I'll read it again and maybe it'll come to you while I read it again. Then at the end of this paragraph, tell me what I just said. Mm -hmm. In other words, the depth of the doctrine of causality expounded by a particular teaching correlates to the depth of the law of enlightenment that forms that teaching's basic premise, right? So that would be there's nothing deeper than nam myoho ren mm -hmm. right off, off the bat, right? Mm -hmm. Then he says, the teaching of nam myoho ren propagated by Nichiren consists of the ultimate law, the ultimate mystic law, myoho, mm -hmm. and the cause and effect that it is based on ren mm -hmm. When we regard this single phrase Nam Yoho Renge Kyo as expressing the ultimate law of cause and effect for attaining Buddhahood. Therefore, by chanting Nam Yoho Renge Kyo even one time, we can realize the cause and effect of enlightenment in our lives at that very moment. What's that saying? That once you chant Nam Yoho Renge Kyo the first time, you have now achieved hearing the name and the words of the truth. Right. You now will become a Buddha regardless. You've now hit, you've now reached the 11th stage of the 52 stages of practice. You've now hit the stage of no, uh, no non-regression. Yeah. Exactly. No return. No return. Okay? No. So, like one nam myoho renge kyo, because it's based on the law of the principle of the simultaneity of cause and effect, which Nietzsche names nam myoho renge kyo. We embrace as nam myoho renge kyo, because it's the ultimate teaching. One invocation of that is enough to create an inseparability that is the same thing as reaching the 11th stage of non-regression. Mm -hmm. Do you follow? Mm -hmm. Okay, so once you, once you hear the name and the words of the truth and say, Nam Yoho Renge Kyo, what's that also mean then? You are no longer a Buddha in theory. Of the six stages of practice, mm -hmm. you are now no longer a Buddha in theory. You are, you've now actualized that. You're now on the path 
That thing that was obscure and is only a potentiality has now been activated. Mm. It always existed. It was always there, but it had never been activated. It had never been actualized. Now it's actualized. It's not created. It's not manifested from something else. It has always been there, mm. but it couldn't become awakened until you woke it up. Yeah. All right? You're, you're with me, right? Yeah. Looking at the religious and philosophical traditions discussed by Nietzsche, we see many differences in how they explain the causality of life. In, in this treatise, Nietzsche evalu evaluates the relative depth of each teaching through the fivefold comparison, thereby clarifying the ultimate causality for attaining Buddhahood, Nam Yaho Rengeku, as the essential teaching for leading all people to the latter day of the law, in, of the latter day of the law, to enlightenment. Let us now discuss the content of the fivefold comparison based on Nietzsche's statements. And you know what? I'm afraid I'm going to rush through this trying to get it all done. I'm going to stop there because it's after 9 already, yes. right? Yeah. So we will carry on with the fivefold comparison as it specifically goes one through five, okay? And finish chapter four. When we, re re when we return in August. Okay. And we will return in August something like? The 20th. But we get it on the 20th, so the following Wednesday, Wednesday after the 20th. Okay. 20th. Which would be? The 31st. The 31st. No, I think it's 24th. When's, what day is the 20th? 20th is uh, Sunday, I think. Saturday. Sunday. Yeah, 20th is Saturday. Saturday. Yeah, so the 24th. That's yeah, what I thought would be 24th. So like the 24th. And then that should give us, we'll actually even have two August meetings because we'll also have the 31, right? 8, 31. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay? So, were there any questions? Did that make anything? Was, that was good stuff, huh? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, everything's, everything's clear? It's done. Mm -hmm. Understanding it more? All right, good. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.